Good afternoon, everybody. I want to first start off by asking you if you've ever heard of somebody being referred to as a cafeteria Christian. Now, can I have a show of hands? Anybody? Well, if you're not familiar with the term, a cafeteria Christian can be de described as somebody who picks and chooses things they dislike or like about the Bible but fail to apply all aspects to their lives. Now, you may be asking why I'm asking you this, and I ask this because I wonder how many of us in our lives have been one. I'm, um, have you ever made your own rules? I want you to be thinking about this in my speech today, okay? Now, Christian Smith and Linda Denton refer to a cafeteria Christian related to a religion, if you will, called moralistic therapeutic deism. And it's kind of a religion that we create subconsciously in our own minds when we're not following the will of God. Now, some common beliefs are that the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. And also that God does not need to be particularly involved in your life unless he's needed to solve a problem. And also that good people go to heaven when they die. It's amazing to me as Christians how we've kind of resulted in ignorant ways of thinking. Many people are misled to believe that a person will earn their place in heaven if they do good works. In fact, uh, 3 out of 5 or 61% believe this. But it can't be true because my Bible tells me in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared hand, beforehand so that we would walk in them. It's also amazing to me how we rank the importance of success in our life compared to what comes first and what comes last. According to Josh McDowell's statistics, feeling personally satisfied is most important for success, followed by having a close group of friends, and lastly, was having an active or spiritual life. Now, what surprises me is a survey of 25,000 youths taken between 2001 and 2000 Two, found that the percentage of 10th graders who said religion played a very important role in their lives increased from only 32% to 35%. The world is not valuing their religious and spiritual life as much as they value their personal satisfaction or their close group of friends. But Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now the Bible is clearly stating here that we are to seek God before anything else, and that will involve putting away our own self-interest, maybe some friends, maybe a close relationship, anything to build that relationship with God. Now, how many of you know that the future lies in the hands of this generation? But how many of you know that we kind of got a little bit corrupted and a little bit off track? Now, we will never be able to lead the world to Christ if we continue to seek and desire every aspect of our life except the most important one, and that is our relationship with God. Now, some statistics that I picked up have revealed that when it comes to the desires teens hold for their future, 66% desire to have a close relationship with God, while only 56% desire to make a difference in the world. 50% desire to be deeply committed to the Christian faith, while only 43% desire to be personally active in church. Now, I want you to think about something. These statistics were taken 10 years ago. Where do you think they are today, and where do you stand in them? Now, not only are the decisions we make for our future important, but the spiritual life we lead and take part in are as important as well. Mm -hmm. Referring back to the importance of our relationship with God, we have to be prepared and equipped and lined up with his word, because too many of us aren't, and if we aren't, we're going to fall short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to spirituality, only 35% of teens read their Bible outside of church, while 28% of teens feel a personal responsibility to tell others about their religious lives, and 56% of these are born-again Christians. And of those who call themselves Christians, 26% said that they were absolutely committed, while 57% said that they were moderately committed to the Christian faith. In general, I'm not satisfied with these statistics. They don't do anything for me, except maybe encourage me to pray a little bit more for this generation. And I would hope, I would hope that it would encourage you, and inspire you to do the same. It's time to grow up and it's time to get serious. People are searching and they want the answer. Right. They want to know who to go to when they have problems. And it's, an up, it's up to us to be able to do that. So I ask again, where do you stand? And it's not about just getting teens to get out there and, and to express their love for God and to show them. But when people and teens have God in their lives, they're less likely to be stressed and depressed and have low self-esteem and suicidal thoughts. Right. With God in their lives, they can make it. Amen. Now, I understand that it can be a little discouraging because we're teens and that's kind of looked down upon. But if you're feeling like you're too young, 
1 Timothy 4.12 says, let, let no one look down on you, your, your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Mm -hmm. And if you're afraid, 2 Timothy 1.7 says, for God has given us a spirit of fear, has, has not given us a spirit of fear, excuse me, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So once again, I ask you, where do you stand? Thank you.